this week for y'all? Maybe. Huh? Good one. Any any good any good day that you're above the ground, well you're you're good, right? What so many blessings that we have to be thankful for the very essence of life. You know, I always say that uh, the very breath that we breathe is that breath that the Father breathed into our long, long, long uh, uncle or grandfather, Adam. That same breath that he breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, you have within yourself. So what a what a blessing. You know, uh, <clears throat> it uh, truly, I think, makes us more aware of who we are and that uh, we are a child of God. Regardless of where we find ourselves and regardless of what we do in this life, you are a created being with the breath of the Father. So <clears throat> it's up to us to make that choice of what we're going to do with that breath. Are we going to curse or are we going to bless? So, you know, <clears throat> that's been the, uh, the subject here the last couple of uh, tour portions was uh, that we talked about. In fact, over the new moon, we talked about the, the, the two mountains, uh, the mountain of Gezrim where the blessings were placed, and the other one <clears throat> as the Mount of Curses. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is a course to continue on of those types of things. This uh, Torah portion is ca called Ketoshim, Ketoshim, and it means holy ones. So, there you go. Amen, brother. That's a, a blast for Ketoshim, the holy ones. Well, are we part of that holy ones? Because, you know, the, the basis word there is kadosh. Kadosh means holy, right? So kadoshims mean the holy ones, more than one. That's what we're all called to be, is holy ones. And uh, sometimes we think, well, that's a pretty powerful thing to be called holy. None of us kind of feel like that we're in, in that position where we could be considered holy. But we're going to find some things today in this Torah portion that really pinpoints <clears throat> that we are and can be holy. So <clears throat> the other one is to know Yahweh in all of our ways. That's really the essence of being holy, is to know Yahweh in all of our ways. All of our ways represent his ways. So <clears throat> we're going to uh, start here with um, <clears throat> evidently there was something that didn't get printed. Let me look here, see if it's on the back side maybe. Oh. Wow. Hmm. About four or five that didn't get printed. Uh, I'm, hopefully they're they're in the uh, the slides, but they didn't get printed for some reason. Okay. <clears throat> uh, that's what this whole Torah portion is about, is being holy, because as we read, starting in Leviticus 19, 1, it says, And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am holy. So if we have a God that is holy, and he says, <clears throat> you can be holy if you follow my instructions because I am holy. So we don't have to worry about any of the things that, that the Father has written or had written through Moses and all the other different things. 
We don't have to check those words out to make sure that they're holy, right? That they're correct. Because he says, I am holy. And he's the one that's doing the speaking throughout all of the scriptures, right? And so <clears throat> we don't have to, to worry about that part of it. All we have to do is to be able to hear and do and be holy. And it goes on and says, You shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Shabbats. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Interesting that he opened this whole thing with, <clears throat> You shall fear every man his mother. Because that is really the only commandment that has a promise with it, right? It says, if you will honor your mother and your father, your days on this earth will be long. That's the promise. So <clears throat> he begins this whole idea of being perfect or being holy with the idea to fear every man his mother. And an interesting thing, <clears throat> I looked up that word fear. So we talk about it quite a bit. You know, we even say it during the prayers and uh, it's interesting even though this is in the Old Testament and in the Hebrew originally when you look it up they go straight over to the Greek and there's at least 19 words in Greek that is associated with the word fear <clears throat> So I thought I would just take a look at it right quick. This is in uh, <clears throat> Strong's Concordance, and this is just one of the words in the Greek. <clears throat> they would like to say there's 19 of them. It says, <clears throat> <clears throat> says, religiously to reverence, moved with fear. This word means to be cautious, to beware, and signifies to act with the reverence produced by a holy fear. Moved with godly fear, it also speaks of human fear of something happening. And it goes on, it says, literally, this word means taking hold well, cautious, and signifies careful as to be the realization of the presence and claims of God, reverencing God, pious, devout, which manifests itself in caution and carefulness in human relationships. This one is an, uh, an axis and a scrupulous worshiper who never changes or admits anything because he is afraid of offending. And it goes on, and there's quite a few different ones. And I thought, well, you know, it really, <clears throat> really points the, the finger at what, really what fear really is, is reverence. We have that godly reverence with, in our actions, not only with God, but with mankind, with each other, that we should have that same godly reverence, Okay. So then it goes on, we're coming back to Leviticus 19.3, <clears throat> and says, uh, You shall fear every man his brother, or reverence every man his mother, okay, and his father, and keep my Shabbats. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. So in reality is not only reverence of your parents, but reverence of their God, our Father, right? So, <clears throat> and that's what he says, so, you have reverence for your mother and dad. You have reverence for me, reverence for me. So therefore, keep my Shabbats, keep my laws. Turn you not into idols, nor make to yourselves molten Elohims, because I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Going on in Leviticus 19, 16, it says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among the people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor, I am Yahweh. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not 
avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, because I am Yahweh. Interesting how he connects himself with every one of these commands. He says, do this because I am your Yahweh. I am your, your father. <clears throat> says here, shall in any wise you rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So it becomes our duty to love our neighbor as ourself. And how does one of the ways that we can do that is that we may be point out to him some of the things that, that he needs to look at in a loving manner. That's always the hard part, isn't it? <clears throat> On that wise, it, in the New Testament, we see in Matthew 18, 15, this very concept. concept. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he shall hear thee, then thou shalt have gained a brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the assembly. But if he neglect to hear the assembly, let him be unto thee as a heathen person and a publican. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Master, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Yeshua said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So I guess that you whip out your pad and you take notes every time that you forgive him. And when you get to that point, that's it. Beautiful, though, that our Father always puts out forgiveness. Always is there to forgive sin when we ask and we turn from our sins. It is boundless love. But we know that eventually there comes a time, you know, that, that that's it. So <clears throat> we need to be understanding of that concept and uh, not, not get on that last uh, nerve. You know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm sure that your mother said, you know, you're, you're, on my, you're on my last nerve, so you better be careful. <laughs> so we need to be thinking of that as we walk this world. You know, he is merciful and long-suffering to forgive, but then he also wants us to be, to be overcomers. As Tommy read this morning in the Beatitudes, those that are overcome will inherit the earth and so forth. So... <clears throat> Going to uh, 1 Timothy 5.20. It says, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. And this is the, the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light, and neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought in Yahweh. He that says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not whether he goes because that darkness has blinded his eyes. None of us want to be walking in darkness, walking around like blind men, right? So we want that light. But you know, <clears throat> you can't hide from that light. Or you shouldn't try to hide from that light. Going on in the first... <clears throat> John 3 says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. This is one of the things that we're studying in uh, West, uh, on uh, Wednesday nights, still in the, the book that Brad wrote. And uh, <clears throat> this is the whole uh, premises of this book is about law and what it is and what the words 
mean and chasing it through from the beginning of the scriptures to the end of the scriptures. And this is one of the things that's always stuck out to me is that <clears throat> if there's no law, then there's no sin, right? Yet we all say we've sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God. And we all are, feel like that we're sinners and so forth. So, <clears throat> so there is a law that has been from the very beginning and it still is. It says, <clears throat> so for sin is a transgression of the law. That's the very definition and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sins not. Whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither have known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. That's some more of this, be holy for he is holy. Be perfect for he is perfect. Be righteous, for he is righteous. So we, if there was not, <clears throat> it, if it was not possible for us to be any of these things, righteous or perfect or holy, why would he put it in there? Why would he say, be you holy, be you perfect, be you righteous? Because we have that ability to obtain to that standing. And he shows you how to be. This is how you become perfect. This is how you become holy, how you become righteous. In this, the children of Elohim are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of Elohim. Yet if we had no standard to know what righteousness really means, then we might have a leg to stand on. Well, we didn't know. I don't, didn't know that. But yet, we have the book from the very beginning that points out what righteousness is and what sinfulness is. <clears throat> it says, Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of Elohim, neither he that loves not his, his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another from the very beginning. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Wow. That's, you know, we <clears throat> have some of the same thing going on in wars and so on and so forth. You know, the exterminating of six million Jews during World War II and so forth. What did they do to be pronounced that they should be killed. Nothing. But the people that pronounced these things were evil themselves, right? That's what it said right there. He, Cain killed him not because <clears throat> that his brother really did something to him. No. No said, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. It says in 1 John 3, it says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has everlasting life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we love because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And he that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, 
shall be in danger of the ganam of fire, the hell of fire. Envy, murder, drunkenness, reviling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are the Messiahs have impelled the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we're in the Messiah, we have killed our flesh, right? We have impelled killed our flesh with the affections and the lust because we are going after the Messiah. We are living like he lived, like he wants us to live. <clears throat> Leviticus 19.19 19 says, You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and wool come upon you. you know, if you read these things, you may you have said, why? What's, what's the big deal? What's wrong with that? It's a, the mingling is the problem. Because he says everything after its kind, not to mix the profane with the holy. So if you're going to sow your field with mingled seed, you're going to get a mingled harvest. You're going to get something that you might not like. You shall not mingle with a garment linen and wool. Because <clears throat> there's been some study done about, we know that that everything that's, that's in the world <clears throat> has a frequency and we have learned that linen and wool have frequencies that actually counsel each other that was that's one reason that God said don't do this because it's not really advantageous to your health to wear these together so <clears throat> and we know that God's a whole lot smarter than us same reason that he says don't eat certain things you know don't touch certain things. <clears throat> says, and we reading in Leviticus 10.10 10 says, and that you may put difference between the holy and the unholy and between unclean and clean. We read in Ezekiel 44.23, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. We, this is such a foreign concept in our world because we think that everything is okay, everything is clean, everything is good, even particularly about eating certain things. A lot of people, if you talk to them about these types of things, they said, oh, well, brother says, hey, don't you remember where he said that all things were clean, everything was good, without really understanding what is being said? And why would he change his mind after 4,000 years, would he come along and change his mind and say, oh, by the way, I was just, just kidding. You can, go ahead and, you can go ahead and eat that a pig or whatever you want to do. You know, it's all right. Would he, would he do such a thing? <clears throat> she says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they sh showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Shabbats and I am profaned among them. So it's a <clears throat> pretty sizable accusation. They have hidden their eyes from my Shabbats. The clean, the unclean, the holy and the unholy, the perfect and the unperfect. Because we, we truly believe that we live in an imperfect world, right? Because of sin. So he's trying to show us, he says, 
you need to understand what is holy and what is not, and what is clean and what is not clean. Then you have an, inf an informed decision to make. So we're going to look at a couple of parables that further states this, parables that the Messiah himself said and wrote, that harkens all the way back to these principles that we're reading about in Leviticus, Matthew 13, 14, uh, 13 24. <clears throat> It says, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Good seed. He didn't sow mangled seed, evidently. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Not a bunch of weeds in here. So what is this? So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in your field? From whence then hath it these tares that are growing? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather my wheat into my barn. Well, we're going to read on, and he's going to uh, tell us everything that about this is what it is. Going on, he says, Declare unto this the parable of the tares of, of the field. Matthew thirteen thirty seven, And he answered and said unto them, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So in our world, in our field, are, what kind of seed are we planting? I think this is really some of the part of the story that he's trying to, to, to relay here. Don't sow your field with mingled seed to start with. And also, if you uh, put good seed in there, you might want to watch somebody that might not you want to put in your field. That evil seed being put into your field. This is on a greater sense of the whole world, and that's really what we have here is <clears throat> the difference with the holy and the unholy the clean and the unclean, all these different types of things are represented in this parable. <clears throat> <clears throat> We're going to read another one. This is out of Deuteronomy 22, 9, the very laws that concern these things. This is, was talking about the seed, not mingled seed. Now he says, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Okay. Talking in Isaiah 5, 1, it says, Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Okay. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof, and he planted it with the choicest vines. And he built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that he should bring forth grapes, but it for brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes.
And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel. So now we get a beginning understanding what he's really talking about and who he's talking to and talking about. Vineyard of Yahweh is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he judged, looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The very essence, the very things that he's, principles that he's showed from the very beginning not to plant bad seed, not to mingle with the world, not to bring in these ideas that, well, oh, that's okay, that's good. <clears throat> but he's talking about the whole world in general. In Matthew, this is talking about the house of Israel. Because we see that, that throughout that, Israel went after other gods and and uh, mingled the things of these nations around, heathen nations, into the belief system, the very thing that we see that's come all the way down to our time and life. The seeds of evilness have been sown in God's vineyard and <clears throat> it's going to reap uh, a lot of gnashing of teeth in the end <clears throat> he goes in to another parable in Matthew 20 it says for the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard remember who's his vineyard the house of Israel he said he's hired these men early in the morning and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. As we read on, we find that this penny a day is eternal life. And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and, who, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and he did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idly, and says unto them, Why stand you here all the day idle? I hired you to go into my vineyard, to work on my vineyard. I hired you to go into Israel early in the morning. Maybe Moses early in the morning and they say unto him because no man that's hired us he says unto them go you also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right thou shall you receive so when even was coming come the master of the vineyard says unto his stewards call the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last unto the first and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour they received every man a penny but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way, and I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. 
Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine evil I evil because I am good? So that the last shall be first and the first last, for many be called but few chosen. So this is a whole picture <clears throat> of salvation given unto Israel, his vineyard, bringing, calling in the prophets all during those periods of times to bring uh, Israel back to where they're supposed to be, to, to repentance and to <clears throat> uh, turning from the things that they had picked up in the world, the association with uh, false gods and idols. He brought all of these prophets along. And what happened, we see in the history that they killed all the prophets, right? Including the Messiah. So, <clears throat> but he says that he called these people in at the 11th hour. If this represents the whole 6,000 or 7,000 years of, of the probationary time on this earth, then if, <clears throat> if we say that the 6,000th year and then comes the 7th thousandth year of, of the millennium so the the sixth hour would be the last hour right would be that 11th hour because on a time clock you would see that 12 is at the top so <clears throat> question is who are these laborers in the vineyard at the 11th hour is that us i think so we say that we're in the last days, right? We are called then for a reason and a purpose into his vineyard to care for his vineyard, to root out those things that have become embedded into his vineyard that are not right. <clears throat> so it says, for many are called, but few are chosen. For now, over 6,000 or some 6,000 years, you look how many people that have been called, and but how many were chosen? Only those that picked up the mantle and picked up <clears throat> what they were supposed to be doing. Even though that they found themselves in places where that they were the only ones standing. And this is what Elijah said, you know. He says, man, I'm the only one here. How am I going to do anything? <clears throat> but it says, if not you, then who? That's what the call is to us at this time. If not you, who is going to? Who is going to stand for, for right? Who is going to stand for that which is <clears throat> right, that which is holy, and that's what is just? <clears throat> <clears throat> Mark twelve twenty nine, And Yeshua answered him, The first of all the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. The very thing that we quote and say every Shabbat, right? And thou shalt love Yahweh the Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your understanding, with all the strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other command greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, teacher, thou hast said the truth, for there is one Elohim, and there is none like other but he. And to love him with all of your heart, with all his understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Yahshua saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of Elohim. So sometimes we <clears throat> say these things. We repeat this every Shabbat. But is it a part of us? Is it really, have, can we see ourselves within in that? Or that was something that was given 2,000, 2,500 years ago or whatever? Or is the Father talking to us also? <clears throat> says, said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of Elohim. 
So that it becomes something, I think, part of the principles of kingdom living. <clears throat> becoming perfect, becoming holy. We're going to look at uh, now Leviticus 20 and verse 2, starting there. It says, again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among the, his people because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to perform to profane my holy name. Interesting that we're in this Torah portion, particularly at this time of the year, and particularly now. All of us have seen the, the news, the things that are going on in the Supreme Court, the striking down of Roe versus Wade. We hope that, that they're going to be strong enough to hold, hold the line because they've got people marching and banging on the door. They've built strong fences 10 feet tall around the Supreme Court to protect the, the judges. You got people every day talking about killing all of them. <clears throat> the very thing that was going on here has been going on in America for some, what, 50, 60 years, whatever it is, 49 years. That's interesting. You and I talked about that. I forgot it. 49 years. What does 49 years bring to you? 50th year brings Jubilee, right? What is Jubilee all about? Release, freedom, release. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is something that, that we truly have prayed for and we need to continue praying for but if they're going to be strong enough if you saw the governor of Texas a couple of days ago in a news interview, he was urging the Supreme Court to go ahead and publish this as the, the ruling. He says, don't wait. He says, you need to go ahead and publish it now and not go through this whole thing of the public opinion banging and and threatening and all of these different things even to our very congress through the president ordered the congress to bring in a national law on abortion make it a national law but praise god they didn't have enough votes to do it <clears throat> and it was pretty close so <clears throat> but I really our message I think should be too this whole thing here is that uh, those that have fallen into this and those that have gone through abortions and these types of things that <clears throat> that that guilt can be overcome because the Father will forgive you of those things if you turn from those types of things. He will forgive you of those things and take that guilt away from you. And I think that should be our real message unto the world <clears throat> is that, that you don't have fear or guilt to carry around the rest of your life. Because if you confess your sins, he is uh, faithful enough to forgive us of our sins. And that sin is no different than any other sin. It may be, think it's a little bit more grievous, but it still is a sin. All sin is grievous in the eyes of the Lord. So <clears throat> I hope that this message will be brought every Every weekend, 
even by those churches that meet on Sundays. Because we're talking about God's law. We're talking about his forgiveness. We're talking about his love. And then we should have lo love for one another over these, even over these grievous things that we, that we feel like is really grievous. <clears throat> those that not only had it done, but those that did it. Those doctors that, that actually in, had taken an oath to do no harm. How can you take an oath to do no harm and then, per, and then do, do that? Doesn't, it doesn't even go together. But like I say, the father is standing now <clears throat> with an open door. And I hope that everyone takes advantage of stepping through that open door. And that uh, the father will <clears throat> put it in the hearts of those that uh, have suffered the, the most. That there is forgiveness and there is uh, to be an overcomer. Because it's read this morning to be an overcomer is what you inherit the earth, right? So, <clears throat> it goes on and it talks about these and we, <clears throat> we relate these two, th two things because when you go back in history and look at who Molech was and what was the things that was going on, and uh, I actually have a, a picture of it, I think, coming up here, but that uh, they uh, sacrificed their children to this God and not even a, a real God. I mean, we're talking about a statue, you know, that has no breath in him and has no life. <coughs> says, uh <coughs> says, if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go whoring after him to commit whoredoms with Molech. So that puts a responsibility on us, on each one of us. You know, we've kind of turned a blind eye to that in this, in this country, even in Christianity. We, we may not do that anymore because we are complacent in that sin when we turn a blind eye to it and say, oh, well, you know, that's just what they do. <clears throat> so then from that standpoint, we as Christians need to ask for forgiveness of that sin that we have done, that we have not taking a more active role these things should be preached from the from the pulpits all the, for all the time as part of God's law as part of his love for us you know there's uh, <clears throat> I think uh, is the picture up go ahead and click it up there no it's blank I don't know what happened but uh, there was there's about four, three or four more slides that didn't didn't come out. But maybe God w wanted me to stop right here, and and this is <clears throat> this is really the essence of Kedoshim, right? Is to be it to be holy, to be perfect. And how how to in anything we do, uh, there's a lot of us that play golf and these types of things. And we're always talking about, man, I, uh, that, that's not good. I need to learn how to do that. How do you do that? Perf uh, practice makes perfect, right? If we practice these principles, we're going to find ourselves holy and perfect, living in God's can't be perfect 
You can't be holy. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You can. And if, if, if it's not possible, then we are following a lying God because he sold a lie. So, so I <coughs> hope that, uh, that each one of you this week as you studied these things, the things that, uh, that brought you more into relationship with the Father and closer to him in prayer, and that we really, truly need to pour prayer on our uh, Supreme Court judge, judges that they won't buckle under the pressure because this is just the beginning of the pressure and it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. And so <clears throat> just uh, pray for, for these men that have been brought for this particular time into the kingdom. And uh, <clears throat> you know that um, that I think to me this is the litmus test for America. What are, as a nation are we going to stand for evil or stand for good? And uh, it's going to uh, be an interesting ride, so you might want to really get buckled down to because. And that was one of the things that I applauded the governor by saying, "You need to go ahead and make this official. You don't wait." Don't let this thing get totally out of hand and with with people going into churches and things. Scotty said something about that he had heard on the news that that uh, there was planned rights and so forth around churches on this weekend. And uh, so uh, we need to be vigilant and, uh, and be on, on our knees praying. So Shabbat Shalom to everyone. <coughs>